This worship service broadcast is coming to you from Christ Evangelical Lutheran Ch Church of Marshall, Minnesota. We are a member of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. In our worship today, we will be singing from Christian worship. Our liturgy is found on page 45. Our psalm will be Psalm 46, found on page 84. The hymns are 384, 390, 389, and 242. May God bless us in our worship of him this morning. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O oh God, 
The glory of Christ is revealed. Let us worship him. May be seated. We sing Psalm 46, found on page 84 in the front of the hymnal. We will sing the psalm together in unison. The first lesson for the Sunday called Septuagesima is written in the second book of Moses, known as Exodus, chapter 17. 
The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why do you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Walk on ahead of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take your, in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and the water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is written in St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapters 9 and 10. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on about to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those who were hired first, when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have burn, borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. 
Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the gospel of the Lord. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Maybe see that.
Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. You might not have guessed it from the title of this Sunday in the church year, Septuagesima, which simply means 70, as we begin our countdown to Easter. You might not have guessed it, but today is all about God's grace. God's pure grace and grace alone. Today, through the parable of the workers in the vineyard, Jesus shows us God's favor, his generosity at work, and to, sh- to whom he shows this favor and why. Today, the Holy Spirit teaches you about grace and calls on you to ask yourself this question. When it comes to God, are you working for wages or are you relying on grace? It's either one or the other. There's no in-between. And you need to know the answer. Because if you're working for wages with God, then you will receive the true wages you deserve, which is everlasting death. If instead you are relying on grace, then the gift you will receive from God is eternal life. This parable might bother some people. If you run a business, for example, or you're a staunch capitalist, you don't do what the landowner did. You don't hire some people for a full day's work and then at the end of the day pay those who only worked one hour the same as those who worked all day. If you do, you go out of business. As an employee, I'm sure you can relate to those who worked all day. They, you can understand why those who put in 12 full hours of work expected to receive more than those who only worked an hour. And you would complain against your employer too if he did that. And if you were working for wages, you might have a right to complain. The very nature of things, uh, the very sense of justice that God has woven into the fact of our being says that if you work harder than someone else, then you should get a bigger return, a bigger reward than someone else. And if God's kingdom were a business in which God evaluates how hard you worked and the quality of your work, and then he paid out wages to people based on how well or how hard each one worked. Well, well, then everyone would still receive the same wages at the end of the day. The wages of sin is death. And all have sinned. That's it. It's that simple. If God's kingdom is a business where if you work hard or not so hard, and you expect wages for your work at the end of the day, you will receive the wages of death. And so will everyone else who works for wages with God. doesn't matter who you are. You could be an Apostle Peter or St. Paul or even Mary, the mother of God. If you're waiting for wages, then you will get paid in righteous God's righteous wrath against your sin, and you will surely die forever. But you see, Jesus says that his kingdom is not like that. It's a kingdom of grace. Grace, the word grace, can be defined as the undeserved love that God shows. Grace, by very definition, can't be deserved. It cannot be merited. It is given freely. It is given abundantly. And it is given equally to all through Jesus Christ, not apart from Christ, because he is the one who merited, who deserved God's love by his hard work, by his righteous life, by his obedient death on the cross, Christ is the very source, the very fount of grace where where God's anger is dispelled, where God's generosity is on display. 
So, where God pays out wages, where God looks at what you deserve, there is wrath and death. But where God hands out grace, where God looks at what Christ has deserved, there is forgiveness for sinners and life and every blessing. Those who approach God for wages, for repayment, for relying on their hard work, they will die eternally. Those who approach, approach God for grace, relying on Christ Jesus, will live eternally. The Apostle Paul writes to the Romans, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Grace is where Jesus is. And Jesus is here for you. In the word of God proclaimed in this pulpit, in the absolution proclaimed to sinners in private, in 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 holy baptism, the Lord Jesus is here for you. In, in holy communion, here he is. Here is grace. Here is forgiveness. Here is where you receive God's generosity, not what you offer to him, your goodness, and or where you tell him how deserving you are. Jesus says at the end of his parable, he says, the last will be first and the first last. With these words, he, he both comforts us and he warns us. The workers in the parable who were hired later in the day, the ones who were hired last, they didn't work out a deal with the landowner. They relied on his grace to give them what was right. And they received his kindness and his favor. Those who were hired first, who worked the hardest and relied on their work for wages, they were not only paid last, but they were viewed as last by the landowner who wanted his generosity, his grace, to be praised, not complained about. With them, he was not pleased in spite of their full day's work. Of course, this wasn't the first time this had happened. This, this kind of thing had been happening all through, throughout history. It happened in our first reading today. You heard with the children of Israel, God showed them pure grace by choosing them out of all the nations in the world to be his own people. And he rescued them out of slavery in Egypt with mighty signs and wonders. And as soon as they got a little bit hungry and thirsty, they grumbled and they complained about God's providence. It wasn't up to their standards. After all, the Egyptians, they weren't his people, and yet God gave them lots of food and water. The children of Israel, the Jews, were God's chosen people. They were the first hired into God's vineyard. But as you heard in, in our epistle, our second lesson today, most of their bodies were scattered throughout the desert. God was not pleased with them. Why not? The first became last. Because they were working for wages as if they deserved something from God. The Gentiles, though, came along late in the game, late in the day, and were given the same portion in God's kingdom, the same promises, the same blood of Christ, the same baptism, the same salvation as the Jews. And many of the Gentiles believed God. They relied on his grace and were saved. The last became first. So now let's say you, let's say you were among the first, the hardest workers. Let's say you were an Apostle Peter or Apostle Paul or Mary, the mother of God. Let, let's say you grew up in the church and never left never strayed to the right or to the left, and you came to church, you gave your offerings, you volunteered in all of that. If you're looking for wages, 
if you think God will reward you for the hard working and the saintly living you've been doing, then congratulations on being first. But guess what? The first shall be last. The first shall be turned away. Or let's say you really are the chief of sinners. And you can think of no one in all of history worse than you. Of course, the Apostle Paul's already claimed that title of being chief of sinners. But let's say you're right there with him. Let's say you've spent your life absent from God's house. Either never been baptized or never serving God or once baptized and then walked away from his word and his people. Let's say you deserve all the fire in hell and the full wrath of God to be poured down upon you. Nonetheless, there is one who has already suffered that fate. That fire and that wrath for you. One who has, uh, has deserved God's grace and favor for you. The one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. God gave his son for sinners. For those who could never earn their way into grace. Not all the way, not most of the way, not even part of the way. God gave his son for sinners who can't earn God's grace at all. So that everyone who tries to earn his grace will lose it for sure. While everyone who trusts in God's grace, in Christ alone for grace, will find it for sure. Of course, this does not mean that works are thrown out. It doesn't mean that Christians can go out and be lazy good for nothings. Grace does not mean that works don't matter. It means that works don't gain or merit Christ's gifts. Works are thrown out when it comes to how sinners are justified. Works are not thrown out when it comes to the good of our neighbor. And so Christians wouldn't think of abandoning good works because our neighbor needs them. Our neighbor needs your kindness and thoughtfulness. Our consideration and respect, our rebuke and correction, our invitation to come and see Jesus here in his word and sacrament. Your parents need your respect and honor. Your children need your tireless care and instruction. Your husband needs your loving submission. Your wife needs your complete self-sacrifice and commitment. Your neighbor needs you to respect God's institution of marriage between a man and a woman for life. Your neighbor who is your employer needs faithful and diligent work out of you. Your neighbor who is your employee needs you to be honorable and fair in the wages that you pay. It's your neighbor who needs these things. And as God's child, you will be diligent in serving your neighbor, not because you're working for wages from God, but because you rely on his grace to you. That's why there was a, a stanza of the hymn we just sang, Salvation Unto Us Has Come, it's not included in our hymnal, that went like this. For faith alone can justify. Works serve the neighbor and supply the proof that faith is living. The first shall be last. That should frighten every saint. When you think you've done enough and surpassed even other people to earn your reward from God, when you think you're successful enough to prove that God's face is shining on you, when you think you've suffered so much that God just has to reward your suffering with his favor, then know that the first will be last. Repent. Abandon your works and return to Christ the fount of grace. But the last will be first. That should comfort every sinner. No one is too lowly. No one is too far gone. No one comes along too late in the game to receive Christ's mercy and grace. And the grace that is received last is the same 
as the grace received first. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom of pure grace. You are sons and daughters of that kingdom through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand. You know, join in singing Te Deum Laudamus, We Praise You, O God, on page 48 in the front of the hymnal.
In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, graciously hear the prayers of your people, that we who justly suffer the consequence of our sin may be mercifully delivered by your goodness to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This worship service has come to you from Christ Evangelical Lutheran Church of Marshall. We invite you to worship with us again. Our Sunday service time is at 8 o'clock a.m. You can also turn into our TV broadcast on Marshall Community Access Stations on Thursday morning at 11.30 and Friday evening at 8.30. Our radio broadcast is heard every Sunday morning on 8 a.m. at KMHL 1400 a.m. 101.7 FM. Christ Lutheran also owns and operates Samuel Lutheran School, a school for children in preschool through 8th grade. We thank you for listening to our broadcast today and pray that you are edified in your worship of the Lord.
Good morning and welcome to all of you. I don't have any announcements besides what's in the, in the bulletin. You can give your attention there, noting, of course, the next call meeting on February 8th and the upcoming Lenten schedule, Ash Wednesday and Lenten services on Thursday evenings during Lent. God be with you on the day and the week ahead.